Speed usage and other restrictions apply. Coverage not available everywhere. See store for details. A brief history of the Middle East. Lecture two. Okay, let's start. Um, what I want to do uh, in terms of a little bit of review from last time is uh, I'd like to spend just a few minutes giving you kind of a quick contrast uh, of Islam with Judaism and Christianity. Uh, just just a few highlights. I mean, you could spend you could probably do a whole course just on this issue. Uh, but I, I think it's interesting and illuminating some of the key differences between the three religions. And I think it gives one a, a, a better understanding of, of Islam as a consequence. In many respects, uh, Islam qua religion, I believe, is uh, quite a bit superior to Christianity. I know that sounds like uh, a horrific things to say, but let me give you some examples. Uh, the issue of success, the issue of having a successful life, for example. According to, uh, just think of the, uh, of the message conveyed by the prophet himself as a symbol for the particular religion. Take Muhammad's life as I described it yesterday, a life. You know, he was a, he was a brutal guy. But he was a military leader, a successful military leader, a successful political leader. Uh, he led what seems to be, according to legend and stories, a happy life. Uh, he had many wives. You know, that could lead to happiness, you know. Um, he had sex. Compare that to Jesus, who had no wives, no sex, no life. Was, a, was in general a miserable guy and who gets crucified in the end and that is the, the, the height of, of his, you know, that is the pinnacle of his career as a prophet, right? Um, the symbol of suffering, the symbol of self-sacrifice, that's what, that is the image provided by Christianity to its followers. So just in terms of that, Islam, at least early on, was very much motivated and driven by this image of success, of the ability to achieve in one's own life. There was far less emphasis in uh, Islam than in Christianity on this afterlife. Uh, there's a lot later on in Islam that builds up on this, you know, going to heaven and stuff. But in the original, in the original stories, the emphasis on success in this life. It's, in that sense, it's much more similar to Judaism than it is to Christianity. Muhammad conquers his promised land. Jesus doesn't have a promised land. And Moses, from Jewish tradition, sees the promised land. God lets him go up on a hill, see the promised land, and then he dies. He never makes it. Muhammad gets everything that he sets out to achieve. And this is very much a characteristic of early Islam, success. And I think it's very important to, for our understanding of the psychology of modern Islam. Because they are conditioned, they, they, given their collectivistic nature and given their, the importance they place on their history, they are conditioned to success. Indeed, uh, one of the authors I read writes that Muslim achievement has been an has been intrinsic to their faith. So I think that is a, a, a key characteristic. Another characteristic in which it is, uh, I think, better, if you will, than, than Christianity, is its uh, attitude towards business, particularly trade. Uh, Islam had a very favorable view of trade. Uh, making money was not viewed as sinful. Again, uh, Muhammad comes from a trader background. He was a commercial agent. His followers and the people in Mecca who followed him were all traders. They were all merchants. And there's a strong emphasis on trying to be successful at trade, on making, you know, making the best of it. Now, once you made a lot of money, you should give some of it away as alms to the poor and share uh, your wealth. But there's none of this, uh, you know, it's harder for a rich man to get into heaven than a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Which is, which is Christianity's attitude towards, uh, towards that. Yeah, Evan. What's the prohibition on interest? 
Yes, it was. And, and, I, and I, as I said, I think in my talk last year, I think there's, there's some, you can understand that for primitive society where they don't understand what interest really means. I think, I think the prohibition on usury is, is somewhat understandable. Now, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to law, again, there's a, there's a difference between Islam and Christianity. Again, Islam is much more uh, like Judaism. Uh, religious law is the most important law, the only law. It encompasses all aspects of life that relate life as it relates to religion, to one's experience with God, but also life as it relates to every single activity in day to day. The Quran tells you, you know, gets into very specific de details on how you should live and how you should relate to other people. The writings later on specify, you know, your day-to-day -day activities. Again, you know, there are sections within the uh, Islamic uh, holy law that relate to sexual positions, which again is very similar to Judaism, because the same thing you'll find in the Jewish uh, books, the Talmud and the Mishnah and, and so on, talk a lot about every little detail in day-to-day -day activity and how you should be, how they should be regulated. Both in Islam and in Judaism, there's no church, there's no pope, there's no orthodoxy, there's no dogma. They are these, uh, they are, in Judaism, they are rabbis, who, but there's no hierarchy of the church, and it, the same is true of Islam. Uh, with one exception, and there's Shiism, which at some point developed kind of institutional clergy, and you can see that in Iran with a very hierarchical basis. As a consequence, there was no, no such thing as excommunication in, uh, in Islam. You're either Muslim or you weren't. Now, uh, Islam, as I said last time, encourages the spreading of Islam. It believes that it is the final word of God. Muhammad was the final prophet, and therefore it holds the truth and that the only salvation to humanity comes from spreading that truth to everybody by whatever means. There are passages in the Quran that explicitly encourage killing non-believers unless they repent. If I quote, when the sacred months are drawn away, slay the polytheist wherever you find them and take them and confine them and lie in wait for them at every place of ambush. But if they repent and perform the prayer, that is, if they become Muslim, and pay the alms and let go their way, God is all forgiving, all compassionate. But then there are other verses in the Quran that completely contradict that. For example, there's a Quran that says, quote, No compulsion is there in religion. Rectitude has become clear from error. So, like the Old Testament, and like the New Testament, you can find almost whatever you want in the Quran. But there is a clear, explicit commandment that relate to spreading the faith, even if they are contradicted elsewhere. Jihad, as I said, I think last time, for moderates has become this struggle within between good and evil. But for the fundamentalists, it means taking over the world. And nothing less will do. And the jihad incorporates a permanent state of hostility. According to Islam, there's the house of peace, which is, are the Muslim states, and there's the house of war, which are the countries of the infidel. And there is a constant state of war between those two houses. Okay, so that's a little bit of flavor of Islam uh, and a little bit of the contrast between it and uh, Christianity and, uh, and Judaism. I think the difference, the fundamental difference between modern Islam, modern Christianity, and modern Judaism is the fact that Judaism and, and uh, Christianity grew up. They took seriously, in a sense, the Enlightenment and they relegated religion to a minor part in the human life. And that most of life is basically determined by secular values, by rational, by reason. Versus Islam never had the enlightenment and never grew up. And it, and it still dominates the entire life of Muslims. 
So let's get back to our history. As I said, when Muhammad dies, he leaves no heirs. And a rivalry starts between the tribes, the various tribes in Medina, and those in Mecca, the, 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 the merchants of Mecca, who originally rejected Muhammad and then accepted him back. The Meccans are more powerful, and they choose one of their own to, uh, to be the first caliph, the first leader of, uh, of the Muslims. Abu Bakr, Muhammad's father-in-law, is the first caliph. He rules from 632 to 634. You'll notice a lot of these, a lot of these rule for very short periods of time. Uh, some of them na- die of natural causes, but many, many, many of them die uh, from assassinations, uh, from violent acts, from rebellions, and so on. Immediately, the first caliph, starting with Abu Bakr, they start going on uh, a mission to expand Islam. And here's a, a map with some of the conquests of, uh, of the Muslims over the next hundred years. Abu Bakr is followed by three uh, other caliphs. Now these four first caliphs are called the rightly guided caliphs. They continue the expansion of Islam up to Syria and Egypt, which they wrestle from the Byzantine Empire, and across to Iraq and Persia. They defeat the Persian Empire and take over Persia. They continue the expansion through North Africa. This expansion starts slowing around 650. And Uthman, who is the third rightly guided caliph, dies in 656. He is followed by Ali. Now Ali plays a pivotal role here. Ali is a cousin and a son-in-law of Muhammad. He is directly related to the prophet and he was the caliph, he was the one that the, uh, Medi- the, the, the uh, followers from Medina wanted to be the first caliph. He was the one that rallied the Medina segment of Islam behind him. As soon as he becomes caliph, he is challenged by the governor of Damascus, who is from one of the old Meccan families. There is a struggle between them. And Ali is finally killed. He is murdered. And the caliphate moves to this Meccan tribe out of Damascus. And at least the center of Islam will moves, moves as a consequence to Damascus. Now the reason Ali is important is because Ali represents the split between the Shiites and the Sunnis. This is why they are Shiites. Because the Shiites believe that Ali and his children and his line should have been the caliphs and that the caliphate was stolen from him. They believe the caliph should always be directly related to Muhammad. They also had a very strong, they they viewed the leader as um, all-knowing they, they viewed him very much as the fascist le- you know, viewer leader. Uh, whereas the Sunnis tend to be more egalitarian, tend to say, well, you know, some of our leaders are good and some of them are bad and some of them know something and some of them don't. The Shiites believe in an all-knowing leader. And again, if you think about Ayatollah Khomeini and his success in Iran, which is a Shiite state, you can see that kind of adoration uh, for a leader. And they viewed Ali in this, in this way. And as soon as he was murdered, they rejected the caliphate and they separated themselves from the body of Islam and became a permanent minority within Islam. Now, there was a second group that also rejected the new caliphate, but it also rejected Ali. They believed Ali wasn't virtuous enough They also believed that the caliph had to be the most virtuous person in Muslim society. And that he was not, it was completely justified to kill him, to assassinate him. 
For them, it was the duty of the Muslim to kill a corrupt and unjust leader. Now, this group was called, and I, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing this, the Karjits. In other words, the rebels. The Karjits means the rebels. The Karjits believed that those committing a grave sin, as soon as you committed a grave sin, you were excluded from Islam. You were no longer a Muslim. Their emphasis was on community, not on a leader. And in many ways, they are the forefathers of today's modern Sunni fundamentalist Islamists. For 300 years following the death of Ali, they periodically rebel. They are responsible for many of the political assassinations within Islam. They're responsible for many of the rebellions within Islam. They believe that if you have a corrupt leader, if the leader of the community of the Muslims is corrupt, it jeopardizes the entire community in God's eyes. So if the leader is corrupt and nothing is done about it, all the Muslims living in that community will not make it into heaven. I'm in Glendale and found love in the South Bay. Yes, I find myself in an L.A. long distance thing. Guess who helped make it work? AT&T. I bought one phone, got another one on them. And romance is alive on the 101. Come into an AT&T store, buy a smartphone, and get one on us. More for your thing. That's our thing. Limited time and areas. Select devices. Each requires up to $900 on installment agreement. Requires one new line of minimum $75 per month service. Free after credits over 30 months, starting within three bills. If cancel service, device balance is due. $30 activation, additional fees, taxes, and restrictions apply. See your local AT&T store for details. I'm in Glendale and found love in the South Bay. Yes, I find myself in an L.A. long distance thing. Guess who helped make it work? AT&T. I bought one phone, got another one on them. And romance is alive on the 101. Come into an AT&T store, buy a smartphone, and get one on us. More for your thing. That's our thing. Limited time and areas. Select devices. Each requires up to $900 on installment agreement. Requires one new line of minimum $75 per month service. Free after credits over 30 months, starting within three bills. If cancel service, device balance is due. $30 activation, additional fees, taxes, and restrictions apply. See your local AT&T store for details. Now this, as we'll see, is a theme that the fundamentalists today pick up on. And uh, as a consequence, they view it as completely legitimate to kill Muslim leaders in Muslim countries, and they consider their Muslim leaders in these countries as the most corrupt people in the world. They are their real targets for rebellion. When Sadat was murdered in 1981, Anwar Sadat, the president of Egypt, the, uh, the assassin cried out, I have killed the Pharaoh. Because to them, Sadat was no longer a Muslim. Because he was not a fundamentalist Muslim. He did not enforce the Islamic law. He was westernizing. He was more modern. And therefore, he no longer was a Muslim. And therefore, they attributed you know, Pharaoh status, pagan status, infidel status to him. And that's why it was okay to kill him. Because you're not allowed to kill a Muslim, but you can kill a, uh, an apostate, somebody who was a Muslim and has rejected Islam. Now, after Muhammad's le- death, during these uh, four, white, uh, four caliphs, the Sharia, Islamic law, is starting to be synthesized. Legal scholars start getting together and starting to establish a legal framework. Now, this period, as I said, is the most admired by the Islamists. And the Islamists is just shorthand for fundamentalist Islamic crazies. The Islamists are the ideologues of this fundamentalist Islam. Not only did this period produce a powerful Islamic empire, they were successful militarily. They produced supposedly this virtuous state. A very autocratic virtuous state. And this is in spite of the historical facts that most of these caliphs were corrupt. They slaughtered each, you know, they, they had rebellions, they were assassinated. This is the period of time where the Islamists, this is what they want to return the Muslim world to. This is their vision of utopia on earth. Is this four caliphs right at the first hundred years after the death of Muhammad. And one of the reasons is, again, the success. Look at what they did. 
Within a hundred years, they built one of the largest empires in the history of man. They expanded into Spain and across into India. Okay. And it is this military power, it is this control over vast lands and vast numbers of people that the Islamists really treasure. We'll see in a little while that Islam has a golden age. That golden age is not what they strive for. They are striving for this, this pre, if you will, golden age, this, this era of real military success. So after Ali's killed, uh, the center of gravity for Islam moves to uh, Damascus, and you get a chain of what are called Umayyad, that is the, the, the family, Caliphs. And uh, even though, according to Islam, the caliph sh is supposed to be chosen based on who is the wisest, most virtuous man of the time, there's a committee that gets together when the caliph dies to choose the next caliph. What you see here is a dynasty. The caliphs are chosen. It's always the son of the caliph that died previously. The Umayyads establish a dynasty, a dynasty that lasts from 661 to 750. The capital is in Damascus, which at the time is a thriving Byzantine city. So this is a Byzantine city which has a lot of the Byzantine culture, a lot of Christians, a lot of Greek libraries, a lot of Greek writings, a lot of the Christian translators who are translating Greece, the Greek writings are in Damascus. Now, Muslim expansion continues into East and Central Asia. Ultimately, they reach Northwest India. In the West, they reach Morocco in 711, and then cross into Europe, taking over Spain. By 716, Spain was under Muslim control. In 736, the Muslims are stopped for the first time. They are stopped in Tours, France. This is the, the first time the Muslim armies meet a real challenge, and indeed their expansion in southwest Europe is stopped forever. Okay. We'll see that they continue expanding from the other side into Europe much later on. The date is 736. The vastness of the territory becomes quite a challenge. There are local revolts, local leaders want to you know, kind of spin off their little uh, dynast dynasties uh, for their own purposes. So this becomes a real challenge. And more and more, the caliphs rely for administration on the Byzantines who were there before, on the bureaucracy set up by the Roman Empire, by the Eastern Roman Empire. Indeed, Greek was the language of government in Damascus, and Persian was the language of government in the East until pretty much into the, in the middle of the 8th century. For the most part, as the Muslims expanded, they left the societies that they conquered alone. They figured out that this notion that there was a better way, uh, rather than taking every tribe and saying, either you convert to Islam or we'll kill you, there's a third very profitable option. And that is, listen, you don't have to convert to Islam as long as you pay us a higher tax. And from the 7th century on, from very early on, as they start expanding, there is a tax that those who are non-Muslim have to pay. And indeed, many of the conversions to Islam from this date on occur in order to reduce taxes. and in order to be able to succeed within their hierarchy being established by the Muslims. So in order to reach positions in government, within the bureaucracy, to achieve positions within the military, you have to be a Muslim. So many of the people around them convert in order to be able to attain these types of positions. It's interesting that as they take over the Byzant Byzantine, the Byzantines, the Christians, they have somewhere to go. They escape into the remnants of Byzantine. You know, what you see there is the, the western part of Turkey is still part of the Byzantine Empire. On the other hand, the Persians have nowhere to go. 
And the Persians convert in mass. And as we'll see, will become a very powerful force in the history of Islam. Now the Umayyads were not very religious. They tended to be skeptics. They were fairly uninterested in religion and religious questions. They were relatively secular leaders. They, they tried to uh, accumulate as much wealth as they could off of their uh, military ventures. They had a very high degree of tolerance towards the Greek culture in their domain, in Syria in particular, which allowed this culture to survive. Indeed, under the Umayyads, we see the beginnings of the translation of the Greek writings into Arabic. They lived like kings. They built enormous castles, surrounding themselves with wealth and ceremony. And they were viewed by fundamentalists, and are viewed to this day by fundamentalists, as a perversion, as the beginning of a decline in Islam. They built these beautiful palaces in the middle of the desert with waterfalls. I mean, the, the descriptions are just magnificent of the kind of places they would, they would enclose these massive hunting grounds where they would entertain their guests out hunting. They built great mosques. In 691, the Aqsa Mosque is built. That is the mosque on the Dome of the Rock. That is in Jerusalem, on the place where it is believed Solomon's temple was. Uh, the mosque that is in the news almost daily. And they chose Jerusalem for a purpose. It was a political statement. They built it on Solomon's temple as a political statement. It was a statement that they were the inheritors of the Jewish and Christian tradition. Judaism and Christianity were passé. This was the new religion. And they built it in the, in the Christian and Jewish holy land for the holy city for that purpose. The site, supposedly, the rock on which this, um, this uh, mosque is built, is supposedly the rock on which Abraham was prepared to sacrifice his son. You all know that story. Okay. But this is a new temple, a magnificent mosque, replacing the old, the new religion, replacing the old religions. In 694, they print the first gold coins outside of the Byzantine Empire. They have arrived economically. Now the Umayyads distinguish sharply between Arab and non-Arab Muslims. To belong to government, to belong to the military, you had to be an Arab. And this created quite a bit of resentment from all these uh, non-Arabs, particularly the Persians, who were now converting to Islam. Arab Muslims held the highest posts in a very hierarchical social structure. Under them, the next rung in the hierarchy, were the non-Arabs who converted to Islam. And under them were what were called protected persons. These were Christians and Jews who, had a, uh, who were protected, they were not harmed unto Islam until you know, probably the 18th and 19th century. They were, they were protected because they were just mistaken. They were still monotheists, but they just didn't get it yet. But since they shared this heritage with Islam, they were not treated poorly. And indeed, Jews and Christians, Jews were treated far better under Islam at, until the 19th century than they were in the same period under, in Europe. And we'll talk about why that all changed in the 19th century. The lowest rung was that for the, was held for the pagans. Pagans could be killed if they didn't convert to Islam, although most of the caliphs preferred that they just pay higher taxes. It reminds me of the tobacco industry. Just. <laughs> So much hair for a newborn. We need to start planning his baptism and his holiday outfit and, ooh, his birthday party. Sure, but um, how long are you planning to stay? 
If you're one of those who goes to meet your newborn nephew and stays until his first birthday party, switch to Cricket Wireless. Use your phone as many days as you want in Mexico without extra cost. Smile. You're on Cricket. Requires eligible plan. Minimum $55 per month. Data speed usage and other restrictions apply. Coverage not available everywhere. See store for details. Hi, I'm the helpful Southern California Honda person. And recently, we've been doing random acts of helpfulness, like surprising a deserving dad with a brand new grill and helping give back to our veterans. And during the Honda Summer Spectacular event, we can help you too with a great deal on a reliable, award-winning Honda, like the Accord, the 2018 North American Car of the Year. Click the dealer locator link to find a dealer near you and go to SoCalHondaDealers.com to suggest a random act of helpfulness for someone you know. <laughs> now, the number of converters obviously uh, r rises sharply over time. And there are more and more and more of these non-Arab Muslims uh, many of them become soldiers, but they cannot advance, but they gain the skills of a soldier. Now, this creates a lot of resentment, as I said, particularly in the East, particularly among the, uh, the, uh, the Persians. And as a consequence, we see civil wars erupting from that area uh, periodically. Uh, the most significant of these, again, because it is significant from the way, uh, from the perspective of Shiites today, was a civil war led by the Shiites at about 680, 685. They were led by the uh, son of Ali, Hussein. And in a famous battle, the Battle of Karbala, which Khomeini used to talk about endlessly in his sermons, Hussein is killed together with all his followers. Now, the Shiites believe that Hussein had a son, although there's no evidence to suggest that he really did, and that this son went into hiding. But we're talking about metaphysical hiding, <laughs> and that he will return one day. And the Shiites in their history, up until Khomeini, became very passive. They are waiting for the son of Hussein to return. In a sense, they are waiting for this Messiah to return to lead them. And the Battle of Kabbalah is the central event in the history of the Shiites. This is the, the, the last descendant, supposedly, direct descendant from Ali, and whatever son just disappeared. Now, you know, most scholars don't believe Hussein even had a son, that this is some... You know, this is a way for them to, to, have, to continue to have hope, is that they created this. In 750, the Umayyads are defeated by the armies of an eastern movement, while not led by the Persians, definitely financed and helped along by the Persians, and that is the Abbasids. And the Abbasids established a new dynasty, and they moved the capital of the Islamic world from Damascus to Baghdad. And Baghdad becomes the capital of the Muslim world. Indeed, this dynasty rules for 500 years, from 750 to 1258, while the caliph is not always, uh, while the Abbasid caliph is not always the real power holder, very early on, while the Abbasids are all Arabs, uh, very early on the Persians basically take over the control of the Muslim state. He is the figurehead of the Muslim state for 500 years, these Abbasid caliphs. Now they come to power, supposedly, in order to restore the orthodox Islamic ways. They appeal to a wide variety of groups, including the Shiites and the non-Arab Muslims. You know, there's a mixture here of both genuine religious feelings and political calculation. And the religious feelings usually uh, get pushed to the side quite early with the Abbasids. You know, in, in the tradition of those days, uh, when they take over, they go out and they kill every single last one of the Umayyad's family. I mean, they, they invite them all to this big feast, and they just slaughter them all in the room. Uh, there's only one Umayyad uh, who survives and actually flees and he moves to Spain and actually establishes an Umayyad dynasty in Spain that is very, very successful. And we'll come back 
to what happens in Spain later on. At this point, there are strong Persian influences on Islam. Dynasty continues to expand the territories under its rule, particularly to the east. And they are for many years largely free from external attack. They are the dominant power in the world. There is no power out there, military power, that can challenge the Islamic empire at this point in time. Nobody on the east until the 13th century, and nobody in Europe. They have a common religion. They standardize on Arabic across the entire region. More and more of the, uh, of the non-Arabs are converting to Islam. They control the trading routes throughout the Middle Ages, uh, from Asia to Europe to Africa. Everything has to flow through them. They live in great luxury. They accumulate enormous amounts of wealth. By the mid-18th century, they import Chinese papermaking technology, and it arrives on the eastern border of their empire. There begins mass production of paper. Large personal libraries are created. Indeed, this is a period in which they take seriously what Muhammad is said to have said, quote, the ink of scholars is more precious than the blood of martyrs. One of those other contradictions within, uh, within the Quran. Arab numerals are imported from India, replacing Roman numerals. And if you've ever tried to do arithmetic with Roman numerals, you know what a huge advantage this is. Now, this didn't arrive in Europe until the 13th century, these, uh, these uh, Arab or Indian, really, numerals. They introduced the concept of the number zero, which, of course, in Roman numerals does not exist. Public education spreads rapidly. There is learning all across the empire, from Bukhara, which is in Uzbekistan, on the eastern border, all the way to Spain and through North Africa. Now, where does all this come from? And this is truly the Islamic golden age. It comes from those scholars who are translating the Greeks, translating them in Damascus. They start with practical Greek texts that have been preserved by the Byzantine Empire and by the Christians of the East in Alexandria and Egypt and in Damascus. They also translate, one of the earliest texts they translate are Aristotle's logic writings. And in general, they, are trans they start translating Greek philosophy. Plato, Aristotle, the Neoplatonists. Most of the translators are Syriatic-speaking Christians. Syriatic was a Syrian-based language. Now, some of, these some of these Christians made some contributions to philosophy and science, primarily medicine. But, but not, nobody, no, nobody of great significance. In, 16, in 641, Alexandria falls to the Muslims, and the great libraries there are open to them. Greek culture has flourished in cities in Egypt, Syria, and Iraq to some extent since the days of Alexander. So a whole world opens up to these Muslims when they take over these centers. Greek has been cultivated as a means for Christian scholars to gain access to theological texts coming primarily out of Alexandria. In addition, as I said, to theological works, Works in logic are translated. Now, the Arab conquest did not interfere with this continued academic pursuit in Syria. And these Christians enjoyed significant amounts of freedom under the Umayyads to continue to have theological debates and to translate and to write. The Umayyads were too busy conquering other lands, too busy accumulating wealth to care about this group of academics. Even in Persia, there were centers of learning composed of Greek scholars who had escaped Byzantine persecution. These scholars and the, Pers and the Persians they influenced had a significant impact on the openness of the Abbasids. Starting in the early 8th century, Arabic, as I said, starts to replace Persian and Greece as the official language, 
and all these texts start being translated into Arabic. By the mid 8th century, they start translating all of Aristotle's works that they have. All in translations of scientific and other philosophical works pick up dramatically under the Abbasids. Indeed, Al Mansur, the Abbasid Caliph who rules from 754 to 775, took a keen interest in scientific and philosophical works and lent his support and patronage to the activities of the translators. The process really picks up with Al-Mansur's great-great-grandson, Al-Mamun, who made a systematic and determined effort to acquire and translate the chief monuments of Greek science and philosophy. He established and presided over an assembly of scholars at which theological and philosophical disputations would occur. He composed theological treaties himself. He was the greatest patron of philosophy and science in the history of Islam. It is said that he was so liberal-minded that he entertained the most adverse commentaries on his reign with, the great, the greatest, with great openness. He sought to apply the categories of Greek thought to Muslim dogmas. And indeed a whole theological school, uh, a, ra a rationalist school they are called, the Mutzilites theological school was established around this premise of bringing logic and Greek ideas into the study of Islam. He used this power, and often violently, to establish this school as the theological school in Islam. He enforced their theology which is far more rational than anything else that was available at the time in Christianity or in Islam. They recognized, for example, free will. They said the Quran was written by Muhammad. It wasn't, it wasn't divine in a sense that uh, God had, uh, had, had written it, that it was eternal as, as many within Islam. You know, things like that. So they took Islam towards a more rational, just like Aquinas and the others started using reason within Christianity later on. They were starting to do this within Islam. They used Greek philosophy to justify theology. Uh, they were great admirers of Aristotle. al Mamun set up the House of Wisdom. That's what it was called. An official institution with a library for translation of Greek writings and research into those writings. He stacked it with purchases that he, met, that he made in Byzantine. He would send his emissaries to Byzantine with the, with the instructions, buy anything you can in Greek. Indeed, the aristocracy within the Abbasid uh, Caliphate, the, the wealthy, competed with one another on who would have the largest library and who could get the most translations done of Greek writings. Ooh, so much hair for a newborn. We need to start planning his baptism and his holiday outfit and, ooh, his birthday party. Sure, but um, how long are you planning to stay? If you're one of those who goes to meet your newborn nephew and stays until his first birthday party, switch to Cricket Wireless. Use your phone as many days as you want in Mexico without extra cost. Smile, you're on Cricket. Requires eligible plan. Minimum $55 per month. Data speed usage and other restrictions supply. Coverage not available everywhere. See store for details. Ooh, so much hair for a newborn. We need to start planning his baptism and his holiday outfit and, ooh, his birthday party. Sure, but um, how long are you planning to stay? If you're one of those who goes to meet your newborn nephew and stays until his first birthday party, switch to Cricket Wireless. Use your phone as many days as you want in Mexico without extra cost. Smile, you're on Cricket. Requires eligible plan. Minimum $55 per month. Data speed usage and other restrictions apply. Coverage not available everywhere. See store for details. In the middle of the 9th century, the Arabs were in possession of 12 of Aristotle's 14 books of the metaphysics, as well as a number of Greek commentaries on it. They were in possession of the books on logic and part of the ethics. The beginning of the 9th century witnessed a genuine scramble for philosophical and scientific material. Now, the key here was that the, that the rulers endorsed this and supported it financially. 
which made the translations of all these works possible. Now, unfortunately, as we will see, they were also translating not just Greek philosophy, but they were also importing and translating Indian and Persian mysticism, which has an impact on them later on. Now, the scholastics, as I said, there's a Muslimite school, uh, was the first to bring in Greek ideas into the theology of Islam. They went, set about in a systematic study of theology using these Greek ideas. They came out for free will and they advocated for logic. They rationalized the idea of the unity of God influenced by Aristotle, but also influenced by Plato. And you see a very strong Platonistic influence. And they're trying here, they're struggling to merge Aristotle with Plato, with Islam. It's a mess. But, but you can see their struggles. You can see that they are generally trying here uh, you know, to, to, to reason and to figure things out. This school thrives until it encounters opposition from one Ibn Hanbal in 855, a very influential theologian of the fundamentalist. And indeed, he is considered the father of fundamentalist Islam in the sense that he is the first guy, the first Muslim to try to counter this rational influence on Muslim culture. He rallies the conservatives to his side, to the anti-Greek side, and he starts rallying, he starts creating an anti-Greek coalition, although he is not successful, and the success only comes quite a bit later. And indeed, the political winds at some point start changing in the middle of the 9th century. But in many regards, it's too late. A real tradition is established here, a tradition of philosophy. And what you get starting in the middle of the 9th century, in spite of the change in the political tide, of the new caliphs being a little bit more reserved with regard to their support of the Greeks, and indeed supporting Hanbal and supporting the more conservative elements, something has been put in motion that is going to be difficult to suppress politically. It's going, to have a philosophy, it's going to take a philosopher to destroy this. No politician is going to be able to do it. What you see starting in the middle of the 9th century is a string of philosophers, of Islamic philosophers, who are predominantly Aristotelian. The first of these is Al-Qidi, who died in 866, and we know mostly that these people, when they died, uh, birth dates are unknown. He, was the first, he went back and he retranslated much of what had been already translated from Greek. He thought the original translations were not accurate enough and he retranslated them and increased their accuracy. He pushed for the use of reason and advocated reason. He wrote 242 works covering such topics as logic, metaphysics, arithmetic, music, astrology, geometry, medicine, theology, psychology, politics, topology, alchemy. You see the kind of scope that these guys had. Now, uh, science developed during this period. You know, the Arabs during this period were inventing algebra. They made significant advances in optics. The, the circulatory system was discovered by, actually, by Arabs before, I can't remember the guy in England, before even Harvey discovers it. There's this significant evidence suggests that they knew about it starting in about the 11th century. So there's this, this advocacy from the part of their philosophies for reason has real impact. He seeks to bridge the gap between Greek philosophy and Islamic dogma by applying rational processes. To quote him, Whoever repudiates the quest for truth as blasphemous must himself blaspheme, for the knowledge of truth involves the knowledge of the divine. So that they're seeking knowledge, they're seeking truth, even if it is in the name of God. Again, very influenced by Aristotle, and he himself translates Aristotle and writes books on logic and reason. Ultimately, of course, he is conflicted. It's the same problem Christianity later encounters. 
You can't unite reason and faith. And he ultimately has to leave, he leaves room, and a big room, for faith and for mystical revelation. He ultimately views revelation as ultimately supreme. He is followed by another philosophy, Ibn al-Rawadi, who is an interesting character in the history of uh, Muslim philosophers. He is actually an atheist. He rejects religion completely. He says reason is completely supreme. He wrote 114 books, most of them criticizing Islam. And indeed, uh, the stories were that the Christians hired him to write these books criticizing Islam. Of course, his books were banned and burnt, so we have very, very little left from him. You know, they're just fragments, and particularly people writing about him. But none of his books survived because by the 3rd century he was completely banned and all his books were burnt and lost. But he was an advocate of reason and attacked the very idea of a prophet and the very idea of the uniqueness of the Quran. He actually said the Quran is just this mixture of Judaism and Christianity and, and some tribal, uh, you know, tribal law and it's nothing very special. Now he was also, and, and I think it's understand, somewhat understandably so, uh, he was also a pretty gloomy guy. He had a very <laughs> malevolent sense of life. And he, he writes, for example, the calamities of life are numerous and continuous. Its joy, on the other hand, comes to you as do holidays. End quote. It's, it's sad because, I mean, he was, a, he was a brave guy to be able to stand up in that kind of environment and, and write. Uh, you know, attacking Islam and being atheist, but it also, the fact that they didn't kill him <laughs> is an enormous indication about the relative freedom within the Abbasid Empire at this time, at this moment, if you will, in history. He's followed by El Razi, died in 925, who was considered the unsurpassed physician of Islam. He ran the Baghdad Hospital. He composed 200 works on a whole range of physical and philosophical issues and some significant medical works. He, for example, rejects the need for prophecy. He said it was superfluous since the God-given light of reason was sufficient for the knowledge of truth. Unfortunately, his thought is primarily platonic. The great, uh, again, is followed by Al-Farabi, who is thought to be the father of Islamic Neoplatonism. He's from 870 to 950. Heavily influenced by both Aristotle and Plato. He came from Central Asia, from uh, the Uzbekistan area, uh, and lived and wrote in Baghdad. Again, many commentaries on Aristotle's logic. He wrote books with titles. These are the titles of the books. The Philosophy of Plato. The Philosophy of Aristotle. The Rise of Philosophy. So this guy wrote these major works on the history of philosophy. He surveyed in his writing the whole range of the sciences known in his days. He was an advocate of reason and logic. Reason, he believed, was the ultimate pathway to happiness. But again, his reason was ultimately detached from reality, as to some extent was reason for the Greeks. He was also undecided, he wrote, about the role of revelations. Now the greatest of the Islamic philosophers of this period was Ibn Sina, Avicenna, as known in, in the Christian world as Avicenna. He was among the first commentators on Aristotle who was later translated into Latin and whom Thomas Aquinas actually read. By many, he's considered the greatest of all Muslim philosophers, and he's definitely the greatest of this, this period, this era. Reason leads to knowledge and understanding of God. But the ultimate object of knowledge is good, is God, and God is pure intellect. He read Aristotle's metaphysics, or is said to have read Aristotle's metaphysics 40 times before he got it. At age 10, he had completed the study of the Quran. By 18, he had mastered logic, physics, and mathematics. Now, we know all this from his autobiography, which he wrote. Right? Autobiography, I guess it's obvious he wrote it. <laughs> he was the most prolific of all Islamic philosophers. 
And unfortunately, unfortunately, all of these philosophers leave room for mysticism. They don't reject mysticism, of, of, except for the one atheist among them. All of them have this platonic influence. I think one thing that's really interesting is that they translated. I mean, somebody could do a, there's a great dissertation here somewhere. But somebody could do a, a, a there's a real interesting uh, parallel between the translation of Aristotle in Islam and the translation of Aristotle in the West and why the one failed and the one succeeded and what was going on. And I think, and this is just pure hypothesis, that the fact that they were translating and so heavily influenced by Plato at the same time as they were doing Aristotle, I think might have doomed the Muslims uh, kind of from the start. Uh, they were very Neoplatonist at the same time. I think that undercut the, the respect for, for logic and reason. As I said, science advanced during this period. They also became very refined map makers. It became very important for them, given their, their, their wide, their huge empire. They do things like in medicine, they, they, they um, introduced the first antiseptic to clean wounds, which is, which is a major... They make the connection at least on a superficial level, between bacteria and infection. They, they discover and, and refine algebra. They make advanta advances in optics and astronomy. And, according to some writers, they discover the rudiments of what will be ultimately called and discovered the scientific method. They are big into experimentation. Arab scientists do a lot of experiments. And in that sense, uh, you know, there, 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 there's reason to believe that it is Christian scholars who came to study in Spain later on who learned the method of experimentation then taking it back to the West in around the 13th and 14th centuries. Of course, at the same time, the Abbasids have immense military and political success. They rule over one of the largest empires in the history of man. Now this all comes to a tragic end in the 11th century. And as we know, the only thing that can kill good philosophy is really, really bad philosophy. Particularly when the good philosophy is mixed. Particularly when the good philosophy has elements of mysticism in it. And the murderer of Islamic philosophy of the golden age of Islam is one Al-Ghazali who was born in 1058 dies 1111 he writes Al-Ghazali uh, was the teacher of his age he was considered the smartest philosopher of his time, the smartest thinker and, and he started out teaching Greek philosophy at the university trying to unite reason and faith just like the previous philosophy, philosophers had tried. At some point he disappears. He leaves the university and disappears into the desert and returns a few years later and announces that it is impossible to unite reason and faith. And therefore, we must abandon reason and that the only path to truth is mystical revelation. Only intuition, only God can lead us to the truth. He writes a book called The Destruction of Philosophy and he declares that reason and Greek philosophy is completely corrupt and that the truth can only be found in the Quran. He denies free will, he denies all that history of theology which had a respect for the human mind, a respect for reason. And by the time of his death, and this is the kind of influence he had, and of course, and by this point he had a political backing, the, the Hannibal school of theology had grown over time, the, the caliphs were now supporting a more Islam, an Islamic line, so they were, they were enforcing his philosophical doctrine. So this all came together in the same point in time. And by the time of his death in 1111, free scientific investigation and philosophical and religious toleration were phenomena of the past in the heart of Islam. 
in Baghdad. The schools were either closed or limited to the study of theology. Conservative theology. Islamic theology with no hint of reason. Scientific progress. Science in general came to a screeching halt and disappears from this part of the world forever. With almost no exceptions. I mean, there were few, but they're always on the borders. Either on the eastern border or as we'll see on the western border. But they are never in this, you know, what's called the Fertile Crescent, which starts here in Basra, through the Euphrates, up through, you know, southern Turkey and down into what today is Israel. That is, that is the only cultivatable land in the region. It's called the Fertile Crescent. Science disappears from that region. From Islam. Indeed, mysticism reigns. Islam develops new breeds of mysticism. Uh, Sufism, which is a very passive, mystical, esoteric belief system, very influenced, no surprise, by Persian and Indian Buddhist mystic, mystic writings. Illuminationists, which start again in the 12th century Persia with an explicit critique of Aristotelianism, with, of logic and of reason, and complete, complete reliance on mystical revelation and intuition. On pol in the political side, the empire is starting to crumble. There is internal strife, religious wars, and there is the first migration into the area of Central Asian tribes. The first Central Asia tribe to migrate into the area of the Turks, the Sejuk tribe, who established their own empire in 1057. They keep the Abbasids as figureheads. But from 1057 onwards, Central Asia, the peoples of Central Asia, play the central role in Islam. The Turks of Turkey today are not from Turkey. That's where they settled in the Middle East. They came from Turkmenistan, which is in central, you should all know now because we have American troops stationed there today, but they, that's Central Asia. They migrated into this area. What is interesting is they converted from their own free will to Islam because they were the more powerful militarily. They could had it go the other way. They rule Persia, is split into several, central, several kingdoms. The West splits itself up. Uh, uh, North Africa and Spain become their own empire. Religious differences are suppressed in each one of these kingdoms. There are wars between these kingdoms. But in general, philosophy is rejected. It is suppressed. Many of these philosophers' writings are burnt in Baghdad. The reason we have them is some of the remnants makes, many of the writings make it to Spain where they are preserved. And any last remnant of Aristotelian or Greek philosophy in the Islamic world is eliminated. Now there is one place in which this is not truthful. There is one place in which the philosophy, philosophy within the Islamic world tries to make a heroic comeback. And we will talk about that one place next time. This course continues with Lecture 3. I'm in Glendale and found love in the South Bay. Yes, I find myself in an L.A. long-distance thing. Guess who helped make it work? AT&T. I bought one phone, got another one on them. And romance is alive on the 101. Come into an AT&T store, buy a smartphone, and get one on us. More for your thing. That's our thing. Limited time in areas. Select devices. Each requires up to $900 on installment agreement. Requires one new line of minimum $75 per month service. Free after credits over 30 months, starting within three bills. If canceled service, device balance is due. $30 activation, additional fees, taxes, and restrictions apply. See your local AT&T store for details. 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 See your local AT&T store for details.